This week on Sports Inclusive, St. Louis Blues goaltending coach David Alexander. David, did you ever believe that you'd make the NHL? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, deep inside, you know, I had a, um, a goal in mind, and I just chipped away at it. Um, you know, I, I started in university really taking a personal project really to kind of study success and what made people successful, um, athletes successful, business and in and, and different, different areas of life. and. One of the things I read was in a book um, that was written a long time ago. Um, and in that book, they talked about the concept of white heat, where you just kind of get this tunnel vision and you know, you just you become a seeker and you just don't stop until you get there. And I kind of developed that mindset. And um, if someone told me I wouldn't have made it during that time, I, I, they would have become someone on the side. You know, they wouldn't have been a part of my group of friends that um, believed in me and that I, I was working along with to get to this, this point. So, How do you go from supply teacher, part-time <laughs> teacher, U University of Maine goalie consultant, yep. to the American Hockey League and to the NHL by 25? How yep. do you do that? It's, it's a, there's, there's a lot of layers to that question, to be honest with you. Um, sacrifice would be the first thing I can, can tell you, you know, uh, sacrificed a lot to get there, um, a lot. Uh, on the family side of it, uh, social life, whatever you, however you want to look at it, it's not a traditional route to get anywhere. You know, you don't, uh, you don't go online and look for the job opening and uh, put your application in. Um, that doesn't exist. Um, there's a lot of uh, sacrifice, work, uh, networking, a whole bunch of stuff. But ultimately, you got to be good at your job, know what you're doing. Um, and if, if you go backwards to that question, you know, that's why I was supply teaching was because I couldn't live in the U.S. and be a volunteer coach at the University of Maine. I couldn't afford it. I would be living. I would no source of income. So I was supply teaching here in Moncton and commuting five hours to practice um, and and to games. And I would stay down there for for you know for a couple days in a row, and then I would come back and supply teach to pay the bills and then go back and, and I you know, wasn't getting paid there. So that's why I was supply teaching initially because I was young and I thought, you know what, uh, it's a great opportunity to coach the University of Maine and we had a couple good goalies go through there at the time and I loved it and ultimately that's what it was. And I thought, you know, eventually, you know, Maine would run its course and I would come back and teach full time and, and away we would go. Um, a few things changed during those years. Um, that led me to where I am, and I guess that's a bit of the luck that's involved with it, and right place or right time. But that was the supply teaching part of it, and it was uh, that was a lot of sacrifice, you know, um, sacrificing salary, <laughs> you know, and 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 time. Um, it, it was tough at times, but uh, worth it. What did you learn as a player coming up through the ranks, yep. and how has that helped you as a coach? Yeah, at, you know, coaching the midget AAA level yep. in Fredericton yep. during your UMB yep. experience yep. and then how did that help you transition into the U of Maine? Right. Um, you know I think one of the, the keys to being a good coach is understanding what drives you and then understand what drives your coaching. Those are two different things and um, it's an interesting question because the reality is um, growing up here in Moncton playing here uh, the Dead James and the Carroll Arena, um, those times. Um, ultimately, I think I underachieved as an athlete. Um, there was failure there. And, uh, but I kept making the teams and moving along. And, you know, even later at UNB, you know, when I got there, I looked back on my schooling, and I pro I under every teacher probably I ever had would say I underachieved as a student. Um, and then I got to the point where I was close to an NCAA Division I scholarship. I had a couple, you know, opportunities, and but I just it, it, it wasn't meant to be. I didn't understand why, but the reality is I had put 10 years of of underachieving together, and, and the result was not making it. Um, and I thought that was unfair, and I didn't understand why. But what I started to learn 
um, was all those years I was, failure is a tough word, I guess, but I was underachieving and failing. And what I learned through my study of success is failure is important. It's, it's, um, there's different ways to look at it. Some guys will say setbacks are springboards. Some people will say fail fast. And I think now when I go back and I look through all those times, um, I probably could have been better had I understand what failure was. And I probably would have achieved more. Um, and now when I'm coaching and I draw back through my time as an athlete and I start looking and, and reflecting, there's things I wish I would have done way better. Because the position of goaltending really is this unbelievable roller coaster of highs and lows. And it's, it's about actually, you know, people talk about managing the highs and lows. It's about looking at the highs and keeping it there. And how to do that is to fail fast, understand what's happening, and move on. And that's really ultimately what I bring back from my, from my years as a youth playing here is, is I probably should have approached it a little bit differently. Um, but it's great. You know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's made me a little bit, it's a little bit of what drives me as a coach now. You talk about coaching. You had some great coaching growing up. Yeah. And they, yeah. he lived under your, your roof, your dad. <laughs> the impact yeah, yeah. that your dad yeah. had on you as a player yeah. and now as a coach yeah. and the time that you spent together, that yeah. has to be special. For sure it is. I think, uh, you know, growing up, he was constantly, if you, if you really sit back and look at what happened during the year, 25 years ago, we started, you know, a hockey camp, or he started a hockey camp. And, he was constantly learning, like just endless amount of learning, trying to know the position, be updated all the time. He was never, um, and still is never, like I know everything. He's always trying to evolve um, as a coach. That was a big deal. He's, he's a student of the game and, and you know, it, it doesn't stop. Um, that was a big thing. And, but also at the same point in time, you know, in his version of, of, of success, he and my mother were both seekers. You know, they, they had something they wanted to do in life and they did it and they worked really hard uh, at, at their craft and what they, you know, what they deemed as success and they both achieved that. And whatever success is, whatever it is in, in everyone's life is different, but they ultimately achieved that because they were driven and being able to now, you know, as I matured in my 20s, <laughs> you know, be able to sit back and look at that, it, it's a big deal, you know, for both of them. You mentioned the word drive. Mm -hmm. It was a drive to the southern, uh, well, to New England and, yeah. and south of the border that yeah. really turned things around. Yeah. Talk about that goaltending uh, consultant and what he meant for your career. Yeah, he, he, um, so part of the learning that I was going through with, with my father, um, I remember one day he said, let's head down. There's a camp down in the Boston area. We should go down and I think he's going to let us you know, step on the ice and just do some coaching and maybe we'll just watch and we just kind of went down on a whim to Brian DeCord's camp, um, which ultimately now is one of the biggest in the world. It's, it's a huge goalie camp. And um, we went down there and, and I remember Brian told me, you know, like, <laughs> he said exactly, he said, you'll be in the NHL by the time you're 35. And, you know, I, I, at that point, I had really never thought of it that way. Like this was actually pre-University of Maine during that transition time. And uh, you know, you hear that from somebody and you're like, okay, yeah, move on. Um, and then a local guy, Alan Power, too. Like Al, I read and heard Al say uh, in different instances, you know, like just because you don't make it as a player doesn't mean you can't make it to the NHL in other ways. Um, and you know, the seed that Brian planted, the words that Al talked about and like, that's when I started kind of thinking about my home life and how my parents were and their drive. And, you know, your mom always tells you you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. You know, that old adage. And you're younger and you think it's just a saying. But there's, there's a lot of power in that when you start to think about what that means. Um, and, you know, so I think at that point in time in my life, there was a whole bunch of different things starting to line up. And I was finally mature enough to, to say, okay, like, this is interesting. And, and then, you know, things started to evolve from there. The evolution of your coaching takes you through the Tampa Bay or uh, yeah. Lightning organization yeah. and some some building years in yeah. the American yeah. Hockey yeah. League. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was awesome. Um, <clears throat> it was awesome for a few reasons. I mean, they have a great model there in Tampa. Um, 
I'd like to say they're like a really sneaky world class organization. I don't think it's sneaky anymore. Yeah. Um, they are they're a world class organization. Um, and my time there was on it was it was unreal um, because the guy running that division of the organization, Julian Brisebois, um, is a very smart man, and he really treats the American League like a lab. It's a place where you, you everyone's learning. The staff, the players. Um, they try different things down there before they bring it to Tampa, and, and they, they, they do a whole bunch of different things there. It's, it's a phenomenal spot. And the confidence that they had in me just to kind of do my job was awesome. And um, some great moments down there, um, both in failure and in success. Um, and the nice thing was is because of the, the culture they have there, the times that you do fail, they... Enc they, they encourage your approach in those situations and, and what are you doing better and what's next and why did we fail and how we, you know, those types of things. They have a really, really, uh, really cerebral approach to how things are happening there and it was an unbelievable spot for me. I was able to run into some amazing athletes, um, gained some mentors in that organization, um, you know, worked under Franz John. Franz ultimately, you know, right now he's one of the longest tenured NHL coaches in one organization. You know, he spent a lot of time there. Um, definitely learned some things from him. Um, have a long history with Franz actually going back to when I was younger. He was one of the first guys working at my dad's camp when it started way back. Um, but um, <clears throat> we really hadn't seen each other or communicated since then. So it was, a, it was an interesting situation. Um, but ultimately, I can't say enough about my time there. It really, uh, it really kind of became a place where I grew into the coach who I am now. I kind of had all this, these experiences and stuff, and then, and then ultimately, like, it kind of all came together there. Um, and it was, um, it was a great spot to be. Tampa was a unique situation where they brought up the American Hockey League coaching staff during their playoff runs. Right. That's, you know, the success that that organization obviously has is bringing you guys up to experience that. How meaningful was that? Um, it's a big deal uh, because, you know, we're down in the American League and we, we didn't make the playoffs in a couple of years, for a few years. And that's nerve wracking as a coach when you don't make the playoffs. Um, but there, there's things to do for, for the American League staff and the, uh, at that time because you have the black aces, you have guys who need to skate to be ready in case you know, they have to play. But there's not that many players that go up. You, know, you get six or eight guys and really one coach could handle that. Um, so ultimately you know, the head coach could go up and, and run it and you'd be fine and, and then the rest of us would stay behind. Um, I remember Julian Brisebois and, and the powers that be asking him, well, what, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I would love to be a fly on the wall for this. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a professional development I could never get anywhere else. And while the Syracuse Crunch were, weren't making the playoffs, Tampa was having some long, healthy playoff runs. Um, you know, being a fly on the wall for the uh, Stanley Cup Finals with Chicago, going through that, that experience. Um, you know, conference finals against Pittsburgh. You know, those were the lessons from that were really valuable. You know, if, if you're, as long as you got your eyes and ears open during those, those times, you're learning uh, so much, things that I would have never anticipated. And um, ultimately, that, that's helped me in a number of ways. It helped me in the following years because Syracuse, we, we had a long, healthy playoff run, you know, eventually, and a, and a playoff run there where we were game six in the finals. Again, you know, and so for me, that helped us, helped me personally in that run. And then now in the NHL, you know, going through those experiences, the hype of the Stanley Cup and, and all of it, 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 it's really helped me in my transition for sure. There's a lot of meaningful learning events that happen there and, and uh, it, it, uh, I'll have, that, those are things that I can't, I can't go get anywhere else, you know, and can't fabricate, you can't, it's just, it, it was um, very grateful those, for those experiences. Well, don't go anywhere, we'll be uh, right back with more Sports Inclusive and David Alexander. Welcome back to Sports Inclusive. My guest, David Alexander. The journey into the, the NHL, we were talking about the Tampa Bay Lightning experience and, and being part of the Syrac Syracuse Crunch. 
but a memorable meeting in the hallway after losing to the Blackhawks, you bump into a former student of yours. How, what did that mean to you? Your, you, your franchise have just suffered a massive loss, but you see a former student reach the ultimate goal. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, was very fortunate to spend some time with Scott Darling at the University of Maine. Um, Scott was, was part of the reason I got hired, actually, at Maine, um, and uh, very grateful for that. Uh, and um, when Scott and the University of Maine, we, we you know, parted ways at, at that time in his career, um, to see him back in the NHL was, was an unbelievable journey for him, unbelievable journey. And you talk about failing fast and, and failing forward and uh, setbacks or springboards, however you want to word it, you know, that guy is a little bit of living proof of what I was trying to get at earlier, yeah. um, but on a whole other level. Um, what a story. And then, uh, you know, going through the playoffs, uh, just being a fly on the wall with Tampa, seeing everything unfold, and then here you are facing Chicago, which is um, very interesting in itself because it's an amazing organization and the history there. And um, But then when Scott's obviously, you know, backing up Corey Crawford at the time, um, and then to see them win the cup, it was gut wrenching, you know, because it's very hard because those moments, you know, you don't know if, if you'll ever see anything like that or come that close, you know. And I wasn't really even directly involved, you know, but it's very difficult because you know the time and the work that's been put in um, at the NHL level to get there. Um, and I remember going down the elevator and walking down the hall, and Scott's family was there. and. Um, you know, they were obviously ecstatic, getting ready to kind of celebrate with Scott wow. and uh, on the ice. And, uh, you know, what a moment for them, um, obviously, and, and a very proud moment of their, for their son and everything that he went through as an athlete and as a person and uh, is a living story of that fail-forward philosophy. And, and um, you know, so good on him. And, uh, and he deserves it. You know, he, he, uh, he, he's worked very hard to drive for him, that's for sure. How difficult was it? to make the decision to part ways with such you know, a, a fantastic organization, really a leap of faith um, to say, I'm ready to take on a, a new challenge mm -hmm. with a new organization. Yep, very difficult. Um, you know, just because it, it's, it was a great place to be, you know, and, and um, it was a great place to be for the people, but when you're in a spot where you're growing all the time as a person and as a coach, um, that's a good place, you know. Um, so that's what made it hard. Uh, that made it very difficult. But, you know, you're sitting down, not quite 35 years old yet, you know, shy a couple days away, and, um, you know, you're presented with that opportunity, and it's something that, you know, maybe like a Stanley Cup, you don't know if it's ever going to come again. And um, so you have to take it. You don't have to, you want to. Yeah. Um, so I guess the part that made it easier was that you're, you know, you're achieving a goal. It's not the, uh, you know, you, you can't say you made it because what is that? You know, there's a lot left to do. Um, it's a long journey. Um, but the Lightning organization was very understanding and, and, and ultimately very happy for me. Um, and, and so that was, that was, that softened the blow a little bit, I guess, on that side of things. But ultimately ecstatic to be in the NHL and, and with an organization like St. Louis. Let's re rewind, sure. really, your UMB days. Yeah. Volunteer coach with a very strong Fredericton uh, AAA yeah. midget program yeah. where you're coaching Jake Allen. Right. Fast forward, St. Louis Blues right. starting goaltender. Right. Jake Allen. The stars align, David. Sure. And you know, when you're looking at your your ultimate goal of being in the NHL at 35, it was a day late or a day. Yeah, it was a day late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, what? How meaningful was that relationship? And do you think that relationship? steered the compass that way? Maybe. Um, maybe. Uh, I think Jake, the, the good thing about Jake over the course of the years was that, you know, we would, 
learn um, in the summer months. You know, we would get together for a week at a hockey camp, and he would come to Moncton to, to train at, at our goalie school, and you know, and we would learn some things from him, and vice versa. And those are those are meaningful. But it's a different environment with Jake. You know, it's uh, it's very different when you're training in the summer than when you're in the heat of the moment in the winter. Um, so Jake Allen in the summer is is different than the winter, and and, and so we had to figure that part out too. Because and, and I'm not the same guy in the summer as I am in the winter. Um, as far as that whole alignment thing, you know, it's it's an interesting thing to think about it that way. Um, you know, I, I, there, there's more to it than that. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why I think I got to St. Louis. Um, ironically, I think that, that the Tampa part of it is, is why I got to St. Louis, actually. Right. You know? Um, and, but, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bizarre world that way, for sure. So it's the whirlwind, really. Yeah. Y you land the job. You have a young family. Yeah. Everything is different. Everyone thinks, oh, it's the dream job. Right. You got to work three times as hard once you're there. Mm -hmm. Discuss all the the distractions outwardly, from oh well, I got to go buy a house. All those yeah, off ice right. issues right. that really affect the the on ice product yeah. and, and the pressures of being a coach at that level. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if people understand how difficult it is to move to the U.S. <laughs> um, and and just it's um it it's not easy it, it's uh you know we chuckle at home we could write a book it's I can't even begin to talk about the stories of of that not just my family you know every family in pro sports goes through um, it's a grind actually yeah. it's not what you think it really isn't and uh, just as much as just trying to buy a car down there isn't easy you know just yeah. <laughs> trying to you know get a convince a landlord in St. Louis that I, I can rent a house. You know, it, it, it's bizarre. You think the easy things would be easy uh, or be given to you even, uh, but that's not the case. The biggest challenge maybe for you, Dave, is the balance and the potential balance of, you know, you're, you have a relationship with Jake. He's the number one guy in St. Louis. You've known him since he was 15. Right that relationship was on ongoing as you mentioned throughout the summers of training but now you're the guy you're the coach yep. and you've got to make sure that he's on his game mm -hmm. and that relationship there's there's some strain there because in the NHL it's all about the W sure it is yeah yeah and I think ultimately you know that's one of the things that I, I kind of pride myself on a little bit is separating emotion from, um, I guess, fact, if you want to call it that way. Um, you know, if, if you bring your emotion to the, the tough situations and, and the good situations, you get too high and too low, and it becomes, that in itself becomes a distraction to your work. Um, you, you almost have to cut it and just understand what is and deal with that. And I think when you get an athlete that's on board with that, then you know, you'll move forward in the right direction. Um, because too often emotion, it's an emotional game, it's an emotional business. And, and that can change from minute to minute. Um, but the more you can manage the emotion, emotional part, um, it's, it's a big deal. And that ultimately comes down to, to relationships. Yeah. Because um, as relaxed as you and I are sitting here having this conversation, if there was emotion in some other way involved, it would change the dynamic of it. And that could be either good or bad yeah. <laughs> for TV, <laughs> right? So right. It, that's, that's ultimately what has to happen there. When you're, yeah, we do have a history, but we have work to do. And whether things are going really well or, or not so well, which is the world of goaltending, you have to keep those emotions in check and, and understand what is and deal with that. Your journey, David, in the game is truly inspiring a as a coach and the way that you handle the pressures and the distractions throughout your journey is truly unique uh, thanks so much for taking the time uh, out of a very very hectic busy <laughs> schedule uh, with the st louis blues organization we wish you all the best uh, continued success uh, at the nhl thank level you. thank you